Good day, everyone. Welcome to uh, NHF's first VWD pre-con. My name is John Velasco. I am one of the managers of education and training, and it is a privilege to be here with you all, especially as we are doing our first virtual conference. So really excited uh, that we are taking advantage of this opportunity. Uh, just to let you know, to be patient with us, you know, we're really excited for this week and all the different programs that are going to be offered and that educational opportunities for all of us to not just network, but really empower ourselves so we can also help others within our community and outside of our community. At NHF, I have the privilege to be working with the BWD community, also working on mental health, the Spanish-speaking community, and the Better You Know campaign, which we will be talking about today. I'm so excited for today's session. Uh, but first, I also want to be, I'm so grateful for CSL Bearing for sponsoring this. And I'd like to introduce Beth Hurst, who is the marketing director for Hemophilia A and the BWD franchise at CSL Bearing. So Beth, please take it away and really excited to have you. Thank you so much for being here, Beth. Great, thank you, John. And just give me a couple seconds while I bring up my screen. You know, it's a virtual world. We're all clear and calm with all this. So thank you so <laughs> right, much for right. your patience. Yep, absolutely. Yep. So hopefully I am up and live. So welcome, everyone. Uh, we are excited. CSL Bearing is very excited to be the proud sponsor of this session um, over the next, I think, I believe, hour and a half. Um, so thank you for having us. And as John mentioned, my name is Beth, and I am the marketing director at CSL Bearing for the Hemophilia A and BWD franchise. And I've been with CSL Bearing for about three years. Um, and before then, I have held numerous roles in sales and marketing at a larger pharmaceutical company for about uh, 18 years. So approximately 20 plus years in the pharmaceutical industry and, and very proud of it. So today, what I would like to share um, as an introduction is a bit of background on CSL Bearing and then also a bit about our product, HumAP, which is used for VWD. Um, so first, we'll start off uh, a bit about CSL Bearing and just a background on our organization. And you know, those of you that know us best, that you may know that you see this tagline you know, on a lot of you know, our websites and any advertisements that we are really driven by our promise. Um, it speaks to the passion that we have for their commitment to patients our partners, our employees, our stakeholders, and other strategic stakeholders. And it reminds us that we're working towards common goals, and that's really for the patient, and our promise to deliver to our stakeholders and to deliver therapies and vaccines, which is so important in the world that we live in today. And more than a century ago, CSL Bearing made a promise to protect the health of those with those serious medical and rare conditions. And as you may know, we're a global biotherapies company, um, and we do specialize <clears throat> in rare disease, obviously one being in the hemophilia coagulation world. So a little more detail about us as CSL Bearing as a global leader in rare disease. So we are in over 60 countries worldwide where our medications are available to patients. We have 25,000 employees around the world. You know, and it's interesting, sometimes, you know, people will ask me, oh, you work for CSL Bearing? And I'll say yes, and, you know, we specialize in rare disease. And when I say how many employees we have around the world, people don't realize that, well, it's a really large organization. And why that is, is, you know, you look at our R&D colleagues, which we, you know, invest in heavily to continue to invest in new medications where we have over 1,700 employees. And then impressive is 230 plus plasma collection centers um, across Europe and North America. And we continue to open additional ones. And during this time, especially during this time, you know, plasma donation and collection, as you know, is critical and so important. Um, and we also have six manufacturing facilities um, where we manufacture um, our products uh, over in six different countries. So when we speak specifically about the bleeding disorder community and how long we've been in this community, you know, it's been 35 plus years that we have been treating hemophilia. 
And when we go back to 1901, the first Nobel Prize in medicine went to Emil von Behring. Um, so we're very proud of our heritage um, in the bleeding disorder community and our commitment to this community um, to continue to look at therapies and provide the therapies um, that we currently have on the market. So specifically, um, the two therapies that we do offer, CSL bearing, uh, for von Willebrand's disease, and you may know that we have other therapies in the hemophilia A and B market, but obviously, you know, we're talking about our VWD precons, so we'll stick to the therapies that we treat, that we have that treat VWD. The first, Humate-P, and we'll dive a little bit into that more. Um, and then stimate. And I do want to address stimate that, as you may know, we do have a voluntary retail or under pharmacy recall currently on stimate. Um, so we have communicated with our distributors um, proactively about this, and we've communicated and are in active communication um, with the patient communities and the patient advocacy groups. So I did want to acknowledge that. So before we dive into um, Humate a bit more, um, I would like to share with you our important safety information. Um, so Humate P, it's an anti-hemophilitic factor, von Willebrand factor complex. And Humate P is approved to treat and prevent bleeding in adults with hemophilia A, which is your classical hemophilia. Humate P also treats spontaneous or trauma-induced bleeding episodes in adults and children with von Willebrand disease and prevents excessive bleeding during and after surgery in patients with mild, moderate, or severe VWD. Humate P is not known to prevent spontaneous bleeding episodes. Do not take Humate P if you have extreme sensitivity or an allergic reaction response to anti-hemophilic or von Willebrand factor preparations. Your doctor will monitor you for events related to abnormal blood clotting. And Humate P is made from human blood and could contain infectious agents. The risk that these agents may transmit disease cannot be completely eliminated, but has been reduced by screening plasma donors and testing donor donated plasma for certain viruses and by inactivating and or removing viruses during manufacturing. And to continue, in studies, more than 5% of patients reported the following adverse reactions to Humate P allergic anaphylactic reactions, including hives, chest tightness, rash, itching, and swelling. And the most common adverse reactions after surgery were bleeding at the wound or infection site or nosebleeds. And as of course, please see the full prescribing information for Humate P, including patient information. And you're encouraged to report any negative side effects of prescription drugs to the FDA. Um, the website and FDA number is listed there. I also will share with you uh, the Stimate uh, important safety information since we did mention that. And Stimate nasal spray 1.5 um, milliliters is a treatment used to stop some types of bleeding in people with mild hemophilia A or mild to moderate um, von Willebrand's disease type 1. Stimate nasal spray should not be used in children under 11 months of age. So all patients using Stimate nasal spray are at risk of water intoxication fluid overload, and low sodium levels in the blood. So as always, follow your healthcare provider's instructions on limiting the amount of fluid you drink when using stimate nasal spray, as too much fluid intake can lead to serious adverse reactions, including seizures, coma, and even death. Fluid restrictions are especially important for children and elderly patients that they are higher risk. So see that patient information leaflet and the prescribing information for stimate nasal spray for some things that could mean your blood sodium level is low, including headache, hallucinations, confusion, restlessness, weight gain, and muscle spasms. Immediately report any of these symptoms to your physician or if necessary, an emergency department. Also contact your doctor immediately if you have uncontrolled bleeding. So, and continue, and this will be the last of the important safety information, then we'll jump into some more product information. But to continue with stimate before being prescribed stimate nasal spray, make sure your doctor knows about all your medical conditions and about any medications you are taking. Use stimate nasal spray exactly as your healthcare provider has instructed. Side effects of stimate nasal spray generally come from having too much water in the body. The most common, including facial flushing, nasal congestion, runny nose, 
nosebleed, sore throat, cough, and upper respiratory infections. Tell your healthcare provider if you experience a side effect that does not go away. And see the full prescribing information for stimate nasal spray, which includes a patient information leaflet. And I mentioned about the FDA website and the phone number. So to dive a little bit into Humate P and what it provides in terms of you know, proven and preferred. And you might see this um, you know, with a patient brochure that you know, provides more information. Humate, it's established and efficacious, and it has been out in the market for over 30 years. So we have a long history with this brand, a long safety history and efficacy um, reported. So we also, Humate P provides bleed control across all VWT, V types, um, including type 3, which is the most severe. So it is indicated for type 1, 2, and 3. And it provides reliable hemostatic control across a broad range of clinical applications. And we're preferred due to the reason it is the number one prescribed VWF uh, factor replacement product. And it is preferred by more patients and physicians. And this is reported by you know, quantitative analysis that is, is done. So when we look at the support in terms of patient support that is offered um, for our products in the VW, for the VWD community, um, I do want to share that we have what is called um, our, my source, and they provide product access support, whether it's from benefits investigation, billing and coding support, um, or coverage and formulary appeals. We also have patient education, um, and we provide um, peer, you know, peer-to-peer -peer engagements in the patient community. You may have heard about our common factor programs, which I'll talk a little bit about on the next slide. And then also the financial assistance, whether it's copay or even a sample program. Um, so we do offer both of those within the VWD community. It does vary a bit. Um, between the two products, between Humate and Stimate, in terms of what is offered, um, you know, especially for the sample program. As CSL, we're really proud of a couple of key highlights that I want to mention here, and you know, several ways on how we support the VWD community. Um, the first, and hopefully some of you are aware of this or have a, had a chance to attend it, which is the NOW conference. So this happens twice a year. Um, once in the spring, once in the fall, you know, in, a, in an ideal world where we can all be live, um, it's in Arizona um, in conjunction with the Arizona chapter. And it's a great conference um, to be able to engage with other patients, engage with HCPs, um, listen to, you know, lectures from HCPs and from patients in the VWD community. Um, and just get to know each other. I had an opportunity to attend the last one that was live, um, and it was a wonderful way to engage um, in the community. So we're really proud of that. We're the sole sponsors of that twice a year, um, and we were, are actively working with them now um, to figure out what does it look like in the virtual environment as we all are. Um, next, we have approximately three to four um, what we call common factor advocates. And these are patients like yourselves that have VWD and can host patient events out in the community, um, either live and or virtual. So we are doing virtual um, engagements, um, even in, you know, continuing in the world that we live in, because we know that, you know, not many people may be able to go out live or just don't want to go out live. Um, so we have migrated um, most to the virtual environment. And then last, I want to mention our, it's called Getting in the Game, JNC, the Junior National Championship. And this is, again, solely sponsored by CSL Bearing in support of the bleeding disorder community. So whether it's hemophilia A, B, or VWD, um, it's a great opportunity to receive a nomination by your chapter. Um, again, this is typically a live event that happens in the fall, usually in October or November, um, and in Arizona. So you know, more information to follow on that. Um, we are doing a whole 
kind of virtual program around this um, since it will be hosted um, virtual this year versus live. So it will, it'll look a little different, um, but I think it'll just be as exciting. So we partner with many in the bleeding disorder community, um, including NHF, um, WFH, LA Kelly. You know, I won't mention all, um, but I do want to mention that you know we do partner very closely with all the advocacy groups, um, and you know work closely with them in terms of you know support and events, and you know we are very you know proud to be able to sponsor the VWD um, pre-con that we're doing right now. So, so thank you for that. Okay, well, th everyone, thank you for your time. And again, we appreciate being here, especially in this first, I guess, live but virtual environment, which is exciting. So, you know, I would say have fun, learn a lot, um, engage. Uh, stop by and see the CSL bearing booth also. So thank you, John. I'll hand it back to you. Thank you so very much uh, for that and really appreciate uh, your time and your energy. Uh, it, is, it is always a privilege to have you and to be able to work with you, Beth. And it's also great to also hear the different collaborations that are happening, not just um, in the United States, but also around the world. Uh, so the VWD community is very uh, greatly appreciative of that. So thank you so much for your time and also for sponsoring our pre-con. Uh, so really excited for the next uh, hour that we all have together, a little bit over an hour. You know, our agenda is as follows. We're going to be talking about, you know, where are we? Where are we now? You know, what are some of the NHF updates? We're also going to be looking at our Better You Know initiatives and what that is and some really good news that I have to share with everybody as well. Um, going to be talking a little bit about our Better You Know advocates, uh, some great initiatives that we started this year. I'm really excited to have two of our seven advocates here today talking about their experience. Then we're going we're gonna to move on over towards men and VWD. Really important to make sure that we're inclusive as much as possible. And then more importantly, we're going to move over towards a global call to action, this incredible initiative that is happening around the world. And we also have a question for you all as we get to that point in terms of, you know, what is your responsibility in all this, right? You know, we are all part of this greater community. And, you know, with great knowledge comes great responsibility. So we're going to be talking about that and have WFH, Luisa Durante, who's going to be talking a little bit more about that, those initiatives. Then we'll have an opportunity to talk about the initiatives here in the United States, we're going to be highlighting two of our great chapters that are going to be talking about their work in the community and stuff that they've done and stuff that they're going to be doing. Really excited to have Madonna and Bridget here with us today. Um, we're also going to move over to talk a little bit about the VWD Connection Foundation. Uh, Jeanette Sessa is not able to be here with us due to the hurricane in Florida, so hope sending her positive energy. And then we're going to end our session today with asking you all a question. And we really want you to think about what you're going to do with the answer to that. So that's up to you. So let's get going. This week is an incredible week. Uh, not only is, our, is it our first virtual conference, but we've got some really good VWD sessions. Uh, later on today, after this session, we have basics of VWD. Then we also have our VWD reception. Really excited. That is being sponsored by Takeda. And we also have our VWD guidelines. Really excited. Uh, Dr. Veronica Flood will be meeting with us on Saturday and talking about the updates and the work that has been done up until this point and then where we're going to be going from here and what to expect out of some of these guidelines. So hopefully you're going to have an opportunity to engage in some of these sessions. Um, and then also just a little shameless plug. Uh, if you notice on your agenda every day, there is either a yoga class or a meditation class, just five minutes. And sometimes it's just really great just to get out of our out of our chairs, you know, out of this position, move up, open up that body. Because the more focused you are, the more centered you are, the better you're going to be able to learn and observe, and then do something with that knowledge. So just a little shameless plug uh, that we also have going on every day. So it's been a long journey. 2020 has certainly been, you know, one of those years that everybody's going to be talking about probably for the rest of their lives. But you know what? Happy August and happy BDC. Although it's been a very rough time for our country, 
there's been some great work that has happened. And what I'm really excited about is actually, you know, what I've learned is that through the darkness, we will find that light. And through that long journey, it's not about reaching that destiny, but it's about what can you learn through that darkness, through that long journey, whether if you're in a car, in a train, on a plane, or even a bicycle, and even walking. It's what you're able to engage with the lessons around you. And one of the great lessons that we've learned thus far, especially through working with BWD, is actually having these great, a plethora of great programming that we're now moving towards the virtual world, right? And it's kind of like one of those like dumb moments. Why haven't we done this before? And, you know, we're so engaged with doing all that great person-to-person programming, which is amazing, right? And nothing can take place of that. But I think in this time, we're able to, like, rearrange our thought patterns, rearrange our objectives and goals, and really see how we can make the best of this. So really excited that our department over at NHF has really embraced the opportunity to learn something from here and to move forward. So get, you know, for the rest of 2020, you'll be seeing a lot of great programming that's happening in the virtual platform. More importantly, 2020, the end of 2020, which is not everybody's, everybody's probably excited that 2020 will end eventually, but also the guidelines, the VWD guidelines, something that we're really looking forward to. One of the things that I've had asked all my speakers, not just today, but the week, is to bring the element of hope. And that's something that you're all going to be hearing about today. Every speaker here is going to be talking about hope. Hope not just for a better tomorrow, but a much more stronger tomorrow that brings empowerment, that brings that opportunity, not just to change your lives, but also to help others. So really excited to move forward with our session today. So it's a long journey, but you are also part of this journey. We are all in this together. Whatever movement it is, whatever movie you want to call it, I'm calling the VWD movement. We are here to move forward. So thank you all for being part of this session. Listen, one of the things that I know, those of you who have known me for the past two years, it is the Better You Know campaign that actually brought, that brought my attention to NHF. It is this campaign which was the reason why I wanted to apply to NHF. It is one of those initiatives that really help empower folks with education, skills, and tools for them to create a difference in the world. So what I want to do at this point is talk a little bit about the Better You Know campaign and introduce some of our advocates. But before we go to that, we're going to have one, you know, one of my favorite uh, authors and poets and activists, Maya Angelou, said, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. And that's what the Better You Know campaign is about. It's about understanding and it's about empowering yourselves. So then you, every one of you who are watching, who are listening, who are part of this movement can create that change and that change that's going to help other generations. So we don't keep making the same mistakes that was done unto us, but the mistakes that we've done to ourselves. So that's what this is about. So honoring that energy of Maya Angelou and that incredible wisdom. So the Better You Know campaign is structured in different ways, and we're going to briefly talk a little bit about that. But here at the, at the bottom left of your screen, you have our advocates, and this year we trained seven advocates to help us move the Better You Know initiatives forward. And they're going to be, two, two of them are going to be talking about their experience. We also have this Better You Know campaign is actually one of our bilingual programs initiatives that we have at NHS. I just want you to like just to sit with that for a moment, right? A bilingual program that from the beginning, we knew the importance to make sure that we are reaching different communities. And we know that there are many more communities, but this is a start. So all of our educational, pro all of our educational materials, which there are nine of them, all of them are in Spanish and in English. And out of those nine educational programs, two of them are specifically for providers. I'm going to talk about those as well in a few minutes. All of this is on our betteryouknow.org, uh, which you're all going to get a chance to go and visit. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about that history. So the history with the Better You Know program 
started back in 2014, where it was an idea and an opportunity to work with the CDC through a cooperative agreement. And the opportunity here was to create an assessment tool for folks who may not know their status of having or being at risk for having a bleeding disorder. So this was the initiative that led to so many great movements from there. So not only do we have this online bilingual initiative, that's also for men and women, it's also anonymous. That was the first creation of this. Then we move forward to create videos, paid media, and some postcards and launching that video in 2016. We then started creating some partnerships around the country, really excited about those and really excited about the partnerships that we're about to create at the end of this year into the next. In 2018, we had the opportunity to work with the American College Health, Health Association, some sororities, AHUAN, and some chapter mini grants that we want to see what could chapters do with these initiatives, not just the risk, pro, not the not just the risk assessment, but also some of the educational programs that are there, and also the educational materials. All of these materials live live on our website on veterino.org in the resource tab. Talk about that in a few minutes as well. In 2019, we launched all of our training materials, all of our educational materials. We moved forward with our paid social media, and we started creating a Better You Know tree. We know that at NHF, we're only able to reach a certain amount of folks, right? We work with our chapters. But what better folks could move that message forward than people within their own communities? So we started this training and our first training that was done was actually in Missouri, which we have Bridget who's gonna be talking a little bit today, not so much about that, but some other VWD initiatives that she's working on. We also did a training for our NYLI youth. Uh, so those were our first types of trainings. And then with the success of that, we realized that we wanted to train local community members that were volunteering their time. So we had about seven uh, volunteers that came to New York in February for three days that got some great training, not just on bleeding disorders, not just so much about the Better You Know initiatives, but also how to create training and how to create educational uh, messages, and more importantly, how to do social media postings. And although you may not hear her today, but she's managing our chat, a big shout out to Lauren Polo, who has been incredible this year and incredible support with her department with the Betty You Know initiatives and that social media campaign. So really, really fortunate to work with these incredible people that I have in my life. So the long-term goals when we're looking at Better You Know is we want to get women, right? So the focus here was women. That was part of the agreement with the CDC. So we wanted to get more women to get diagnosed for their bleeding disorders. We know that the numbers do not match the reality. And this is the issue, that we want to cut that 15-year number Right, that it should not take so much pain and frustration and agony and stress for somebody to be properly diagnosed. And some folks don't even know that this is part of their lives. Right? So part of the initiatives was to lessen that time to empower and educate folks about bleeding disorders and for them to start creating healthy dialogues with their providers. So the idea here is to cut the length of time between onset of symptoms and diagnosis of bleeding disorders and reduce it. Because we want people to live better lives and fuller lives and lives that they have knowledge and empowerment about their bodies. That's the goal here. And these are the long-term goals. And at the end of the day, when we can assess that, then we know we've done our work. Just, you know, some people like numbers. Um, so here are a couple of number touch points for you all to look at in terms of what we've done so far in the past couple of years. What I'm really impressed with is not just the potential audience that we've reached or the social media impressions, but if you look at the last number, that 85%, that 85% is a consistent number in regards to people that have taken and do take the risk assessment tool which is on betteryouknow.org. If you, 85% of the folks that take that risk, risk assessment test positive for having a risk or for being at risk for having a bleeding disorder. 
that's 85%. That to me is an incredible number. And that number is a number that actually makes me want to keep doing more because I know we're reaching an incredible amount of community members that don't even know that they're part of the community. Right? That don't even know that, oh, you know, this is why I have bruising. This is why I have such a long, heavy flow. I just thought it was just in my family. Right? I just thought that I just came from heavy bleeders is something which I hear often around the country. 85%. So if there's one number that I want you to take away with today is that number. That the opportunity for you to share the better you know org message on your social medias or when you're having having conversations, that's that energy that's going to move you forward. So 85%. And that means we're doing the work that we're supposed to be doing. So going back to that assessment tool, as, you, I, as I said before, this is a bilingual program. As you can see here, we've got a tab for Spanish and English. And within those tabs, we have one specifically for men and specifically one for women. So we want you to understand that the CDC agreement that we have, that we're so lucky to have had that opportunity to work with the CDC, the focus here was women. But when we created these initiatives, we realized that, hey, it's a great opportunity to keep making sure that we are inclusive of our communities to make sure that we have information there for men. Uh, so just want to make sure that we have that, uh, you know, that a little bit of that understanding. All right, the bilingual education materials. Here are eight education materials that you actually, right after the session's over, you can actually go to betteryouknow.org, go to the resource page, find these. They're in PDF forms. You can download them. You can print them if you have a printer at home. If you're going to Staples, make sure you wear your masks. Um, but here is something that you can also share. You can share it through an email. You can share it through your TikTok, your, your Facebook, your tweets, your Instagram. And you know, listen, even and some of you are on dating sites, share it on your dating sites. Everybody needs to know this information. But these are great information. And specifically, two of these are specific for our providers. And when we're talking about providers, we have one that's for general providers, and one specifically for OBGYN, right? The education here is not so much for community members, but making sure that we empower our providers so they can remind themselves that this is an issue and that folks are going to come into their office that sometimes are being misdiagnosed. And that's part of the next, um, next partnership that we're going to be developing within this year is working more with those uh, providers. The other thing that I want you to know is that we're actually fortunate to have a couple of webinars that are specifically for our providers. Those webinars live live on betteryouknow.org. And up until October, um, providers can actually get credit for that um, to maintain their credentials. So really important for us to know. The out of all of these, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like having children. You're not supposed to have a favorite child. Um, but some of the favorite <laughs> um, educational materials here have been the lab test brochure for patients, really good information there in terms of understanding what those tests look like, and also the brochure for teen girls. Those are the ones that are being downloaded quickly or being asked us to send out to different communities. Uh, so really excited and such a privilege to have worked with the CDC. So very grateful for that opportunity. All right, so listen. All this is great, right? You can have the best website possible. You can have the best educational materials out there. But what do you do with them? You need people to bring that message out. And there's only so much that one person can do. So we started this Better You Know Advocate Program, where we found incredible volunteers who were willing to give up their time, their energy, to really create a difference. It's been a privilege to work with them to get to know them on a personal level, and also to see some of their creative ideas of how they're going to be making a difference in their communities. These advocates were trained specifically with the idea of taking the message out into the social media world and also create outreach efforts in their community, in their regions, and also educational opportunities. So, COVID happens. All right, COVID happens. You keep moving forward. There's that darkness that I talked about earlier, right? That long journey. These advocates 
you know, put that obviously to the side and then took over the social media campaign and really moved forward. So I'm really excited to have this opportunity to introduce you to two of our advocates who are going to be talking about the differences that they made um, in their community, highlighting not just their training, but talk, talking to you a little bit about their stories. So really excited here to introduce Lisa Webb, uh, who's coming uh, live from Houston, I think, or outside of Houston, Texas. Um, um, but real excited for her to share her story and have her talk a little bit more about her program and what she's been doing um, down in beautiful Texas. So Lisa, welcome to our pre-con and they're all yours. Thank you, John. Hi, y'all from the great nation of Texas. I want to say thank you to the National Hemophilia Foundation for the opportunity to be a better you know advocate. Truly appreciate John and his team for empowering me to have a bigger voice for the women who have a bleeding disorder and don't know it. Today I celebrate the gift of life and choosing hope. On this exact day, I had a major surgery as an outpatient not knowing I had a rare bleeding disorder. To me, the word hemophilia at that time meant, you bleed to death if you receive a cut. It was on this date, on August the 1st, eight years ago, I was officially diagnosed by an oncologist with hemophilia C, mild factor 11. And at that time, I was a single mom, and I used my faith to be strong and refused to let my diagnosis stop me from being alive for my boys. I have been told it was my strong will that kept me alive when I found out I was facing major surgery because my faith was strong at that time. I literally told God in prayer, I live or I die. It is because of the education my family and I received by attending National Hemophilia Foundation events. I found out that I have a family of blood brothers and sisters who are here for me. The Better You Know website and the National Hemophilia website has reliable information to educate yourself and to those who have been diagnosed because you didn't know what was going on for all your life, and those who are waiting to be diagnosed, because that's just the way it is in our family, I encourage you to advocate for your own health, not just for you, but for your family. Fight with knowledge to have a better quality of life. For those who are really di who are recently diagnosed, don't go into the rabbit hole of fear. For a couple of years, I did that. And when you're a single mom, you really don't have time to do that. But I did that. But fear can stop you from going forward in your life. But when you choose to have hope and become empowered with others, then you can go forward with your life. For those who are recently diagnosed, we have a family. We are a community that we can grow together and learn from each other, not just on social media, but via text message and phone calls. This, there is an entire community to listen and be there with you and your family, especially during the past couple of months. You have had a choice to make. You can focus on negativity and have it affects your health, or you can choose to find the positive every day and improve your immune system by simply being hopeful instead of giving in to the fear. I appreciate the nurses and medical staff who take the time to be educated about the different facets there is to a bleeding disorder, because as we have found out through technology, and through testing over the past several years, you don't have just a bleeding disorder. There's multiple facets to it. And if you're male or if you're female, then your treatment will affect your body differently also. 
I want to say thank you to the pharma companies that do research to improve the quality of life for those of us with pre-existing conditions. I give a virtual hug to my blood brothers and sisters because we can get through this together. One of the things that I have learned in the past couple of months through the better being a better you know healthcare advocate is to blow up social media. Copy, paste, share. Um, I've added my tag. I said please share, click on this link. And sometimes I've used memes. So a lot of times I've shared better you know advocacy what's come across my Facebook page. I hit share and include my tagline and then that includes, that opens up the opportunity to others of what's going on with better you know advocacy. Because when people have hope, then they will make better decisions. When people are empowered with knowledge, then they will make better decisions. And yes, I did have my whole list of um, on my agenda of where to be, had started to get things set up. And well, hello. <laughs> we have joined on this journey um, of getting your priorities refocused. The reason why I chose this picture of for instead of my picture, I chose a picture of water because you have clouds but you also have blue sky above it but this is also a great opportunity for a sunrise in your life to go forward with your life and make positive decisions so i just want to say that y'all have an awesome day remember every day that you get to wake up is a gift use it wisely to better the world around you and now I give it back to John. Thank you so much, Lisa. It is, a, again, a privilege to hear your story and to see the strength that is within you, right? And that strength that people can learn from you and be also inspired by you. So really appreciate all the work that you've done and also the work that you're going to be doing because your job as a better you know advocate ain't over. Uh, so really excited to see um, how you're going to take that message and move it forward. So thank you so very much. Um, we also now have Jill McRae, um, who is another incredible uh, Better You Know advocate. Again, part of that training that happened in February. And she's been doing incredible work out on the Pacific Coast. And she's going to be sharing some of those stories. And I hope she shares one of those amazing stories that I know you're going to be talking about, Jill, uh, that happened to you right when you left New York City and you just started the uh, your work as an advocate. So, Jill, it's all yours. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, John. I appreciate having um this opportunity to, to talk and to share a little bit about my story. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background. I am adopted, so I have no idea what was in my family history. And so um, growing up, I had kind of the typical, what I know now as uh, pretty typical bleeding disorders issues. Um, nosebleeds, the heavy periods. Uh, my favorite was my pediatrician told my mom I was an easy, I had easy bruising syndrome. Never heard of that before. So that was, that was uh, kind of what we went with. Um, I'm one of the ones that had a 15 plus year, um, not necessarily until my diagnosis, but I was diagnosed um, in my early 20s after having my daughter uh, c-section um, my OBGYN when I went in to him to talk about having another child um, I was basically told that he didn't want to have me as a patient anymore and to go find somebody else so my husband and I made the hard decision um, to only have one child it wasn't until I was well into my 30s that I found out more about, let me, sorry, let me back up just a little bit. So I was diagnosed two years after my C-section. 
the hematologist told me, don't worry about it, I will outgrow it. So then we skip forward about 15 years and I run into somebody that's running a booth on bleeding disorders at a women's conference that was just a little local conference that had everything from uh, women in sports to purses and I went with my mom just thinking I was going to get a free lunch and surprisingly I turned around the first corner there was a huge sign that said do you have nosebleeds do you bruise do you have heavy periods you may have von Willebrand disease well, I walked right up to the, to the woman manning the booth, and I said, well, I have that. And she asked me, uh, what product do you use? And I had one of those internal conversations with myself. Um, do I say, I don't, I, basically, I finally told her, I don't know what you're talking about. No idea what a product is. I didn't understand what she was talking about. She so graciously gave me a hug, held me by the hand, and walked me through how to figure out what I needed to do for myself. Which brings me to the advocacy part. I am huge into advocacy. My experience that I had um, was not the best. Um, once I even knew what I was doing, uh, knew what I needed, and was on a factor, I still wasn't receiving the support that I didn't know I needed. And so uh, I'm sure that my story is very similar to a lot of stories out there. And that's one of the reasons why I want to share the message of we are all in this together. We are a community. I like to call it, it's, you know, this is my tribe. And if one of my tribe needs to go into battle, I will be right there behind you, pushing you if needed, or beside you, helping you out. So the, with the better you know, when this came along, I was so excited and so worried and so nervous about being chosen for it. And then once, uh, once I found out that I got to go and become a part of this amazing program, uh, I was on fire. I could not wait to get home and start. And I am not a social media person. I don't like to be on Facebook. I had an Instagram account, never had done anything else. TikTok was like, what the heck is that? Didn't know. So anyways, I put together my first post and I was really excited for it. So I took the post, I made it, I remade it, I remade it again. Then I just decided to send it. I, it wasn't even 24 hours later. I was contacted by, um, she was an acquaintance of mine, and she contacted me and said, oh my goodness, I have a daughter and we're having issues. And so through talking with her through Facebook Messenger, we were able to and I say we because it was because of the Better You Know advocacy program that we, as our group, I was able to take this information that I had gained while being at the training and help send her in the direction that she needed to take her daughter. She was able to take her daughter and start going through the steps to um, getting a diagnosis. Since that time, her younger daughter also started the same journey as her older daughter. She's able to get her daughter into, you know, into the uh, clinic where their needs are being taken care of. So that's what I think of for the, the better you know. It is the better you know. The more education that we have, the better advocates we are, not only for ourselves, but for those around us. Um, I found that 
being able to take things into my physician and saying, here you go. Instead of just me trying to educate with what I have, I can actually say, here is something from the National Hemophilia Foundation in conjunction with the CDC. Here's some information, which also tells them where they can find more information. So that to me was extremely exciting and empowering. So my, my uh, thoughts on this the Better You Know Advocacy is just, it's, it's an amazing program. I cannot wait to see where this is going to be because had I known back when I was that young 22 year old just having had a baby and being told I was never going to have another one um, and now having the information that I have now I don't want people to go through what I had to go through I want to help educate and empower those that are undiagnosed newly diagnosed and those that have been diagnosed but don't understand what all is available to them. So once again, thank you, NHF. I, I have just really appreciated this opportunity to share a little bit of my story, um, but share my excitement. So I hope this comes through, that I am extremely excited for everybody that's attending this session. Please don't just take what you hear and place it somewhere in your brain or just think about this is the time to come together and empower each other and move this forward so that we can all help each other out so once again thank you john and thank you lauren and nhf and all of the other better you know advocates let's do this uh, you're, you are truly amazing, Jill. Thank you so much for your energy and for your stories. So because we're going live, uh, you know, we can do whatever we want. Uh, so we're going to take a little pause here, and I'm actually going to ask Lisa and Jill one question. Uh, so in a few seconds, I'm going to ask you both to unmute your mic. Uh, but I do want to take this moment to sincerely, again, thank Lauren for being an incredible uh, trainer and supporter of this program. The communications department at NHF really were instrumental in the training for the Better You Know Advocates and then also moving our initiative forward. Again, it takes a village, it takes a community, it takes all of us to be part of this. So some of the good news is as we're going to be developing the Better You Know a project and moving it forward, we're going to be doing Better You Know in Espanol, so continuing that bilingual um, initiatives, um, and also growing the Better You Know Advocates. So Lisa and Jill, I know I didn't tell you this earlier, but I have a question for you all. So if you can think about one to three things that you are taking away from your training and you would encourage others to also apply to be a volunteer, how would, you, how would that message be like? What would you want other folks to know something about that training and all the aftermath after that training that's gonna help others? So I'm just curious for you too, if you could just, you know, on the spot, unmute yourselves and we'll go with Lisa and Jill, whoever wants to go first, um, and just, you know, please tell us, you know, what it is that you would encourage others um, uh, and why. Thank you. Hi, Jill. Hey, Lisa. <laughs> um, I'll start off first. Um, I would strongly encourage others to apply to be a better you know advocate. This literally empowered me as a woman. Um, I also got to be around other leaders who I found out had the same goals that I do with helping others mm -hmm. in the hemophilia community, but also to educate those in the healthcare system. And I got to be around a great group of people who had the same goals that I did. Yeah, so I, I agree with what Lisa said. Um, I know it was extremely helpful to me. It, 
like I said, it, it, it lit a fire under me that had kind of gone dormant um, for a little bit. Um, the advocacy part of it, the helping others, it is life-changing for them. I know that the, that the woman that gave me that first hug um, and led me through, I wanted to do what she had done for me for others. And so anybody else that has the opportunity to become a Better You Know advocate, I would say take it. Um, I, I was really, really kind of bummed out because I didn't get to go and do the person to person that I was looking forward to. I had things set up, um, you know, for tables and passing out um, information and flyers because I really enjoy the one on one. So doing it in social media where I don't get that feedback immediately. I am one of those people that, yes, I am a hugger. And I have found that many of us in the bleeding disorders community are the exact same way. So it's really hard just to do the virtual hugs. Um, but it, it, I can't say enough about the training that I received, the support that is there, and the fact that we are all trying and moving in the same direction. So it's this whole movement and this whole community, this whole tribe of mine that we're trying to get out there to help others on their journey. And to me, that is such a blessing in my life to be able to um, be with a great group of people and help others. Thank you so very much, Jill. I really appreciate that. And thank you, Lisa, both of you for uh, doing the work that you're doing. And listen, we know that this phase of COVID will end and we're going to get out there in the field and we're going to be doing that work. So we are just beginning. Uh, so thank you so very much for your time and your energy. Uh, so next, we're going to move forward um, as time is always of the essence. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, BWD and men. And I've had the honor to work with Jason Walsh. This is our second year working with him. Um, he's a nurse. Um, out in California, and he's going to talk a little bit about his life, his personal story, and also encourage other men to start, you know, voicing out, you know, our experiences as well. So, Jason, they're all yours. Hello. Um, I'm just going to do like a quick recap of of um, the way things kind of started with getting diagnosed, and um, it's definitely going to follow the long journey theme. So, bear with me if you can. Um, when I was born, I was born premature. I had bone deformities in both my legs. Um, I had some underdeveloped lungs. So, um, you know, basically I grew up around being in the hospital, being in that environment. And uh, growing up, I just, you know, I couldn't walk very well. Everything was kind of a difficult, more difficult process, but I still got into trouble like any other little boy. Um, and I uh, <clears throat> eventually got four reconstructive surgeries on my legs, um, all without being diagnosed with a bleeding disorder. So I had, you know, bone grafting and partial fusions and double knee surgery twice and had um, bleeding issues with each one and never I, I didn't know what a bleeding disorder was. Um, never got tested, never mentioned anything. Um, they would keep me in the hospital for observation and then let me go basically without um, any mention of it. But my mom wasn't as concerned because she came from that background of, of women that were considered to be heavy bleeders, nothing else. Um, so we kind of, you know, explained away everything that was going on, any bruising that I had, it was, you know, oh, that runs in the family, it's no, no big deal, no diagnosis. Um, <clears throat> and so once I went through all of those, got everything, uh, when it started going into physical therapy, um, I was basically told that I was never gonna walk again. The bone grafting that they did 
wasn't solidifying the way that it should. So they said that if I tried to put any weight on my legs, that the um, grafted ankles would basically break into pieces. So um, being the stubborn one that I am, started trying to work, walk on my own and uh, got caught one too many times. So we um, got referred to physical therapy and, and started that process. Um, we uh, had to go to about three or four physical therapists before there was one that would even consider taking the case, uh, just because of the way that my bone structure was and everything that was going on. Um, we had a, a little bit of a journey uh, trying to figure out what to do next. So um, went into physical therapy in the next year. I was walking, I was running, and I wanted to play sports. <laughs> so um, tried out for every sport that, that was under the sun that uh, I had access to and um, couldn't uh, do what I really wanted to, was, which was playing football. Um, my surgeon wouldn't clear me medically. Um, so then I found wrestling and uh, got my mom cleared me or my mom was kind of tired of telling me no. So she um, said, okay, if the doctor clears you, then you can do it. And, you know, said that she um, wasn't going to be the one to tell me no. So once he cleared me, uh, of course, she cried and begged me to join the chess club. So um, I started wrestling, got to do a lot of great traveling, a lot of um, sponsored things that I was able to do through there. And then uh, I was also doing karate competitively and uh, went through like just that great experience of, of being able to play sports and finally, you know, um, being able to do something physical that I enjoyed. Uh, went into um, actually the state championships and got that experience. Um, and you know, as things were going through with that, um, right when I was going to start trying out for, for college and doing those things, looking for scholarships, I got diagnosed with the bleeding disorder. After having all that, uh, I was already kind of in the community because my sisters both got diagnosed before I did. My mom was actually in her 40s when she got diagnosed. And that was kind of what brought it all together. Um, Having that community around me, even before a little bit before I was diagnosed, and already being semi ingrained, uh, already volunteering, everything, it just kind of made things a little bit clearer um, with what we could do next and what um, what was actually kind of involved with everything. So, you know, going to my first hematologist, uh, he was actually not great. Um, I had to spell von Willebrand's for him. And then every time I had a question, he would go out to consult. And then he would come back with like a two or three word answer. And the medication was non formulary. So I didn't, he told me I didn't need any medication. And so I ended up being hospitalized for a teeth cleaning, basically, um, went into just kind of a denial phase after that. Like I, I kept doing martial arts, I was teaching, I was, um, you know, got into Krav Maga to kind of you know, quote unquote, take it easy and um, ended up having a lot of joint bleeds, which is another thing that they tell you that never happens. Every time I would go in um, with, you know, joint swelling, redness, um, kind of the classic signs, they would tell me, you know, oh, you know, you're an active guy, you're in martial arts, you're gonna, you're gonna get some swelling. Or, you know, when I would have, you know, 15 minute nosebleeds, I would get a cauterization and they would send me home. Um, and so I kind of went through that phase where it was just, I didn't want to push um, for what I needed. I, the doctors didn't want to give it to me. So I didn't, um, I guess have, like, even though I had the community with me, I, I wasn't educating myself the way that I probably should have. 
or definitely should have. Um, so I went through and just kind of did what I wanted for a little bit and um, wasn't as plugged in as, as people were kind of, you know, pulling me in to be accepted and to be part of the group and to do all these things. And I um, wasn't really in the, in the headspace to do, to do that. Uh, when I finally did, it was awesome. You know, I was going into nursing school, um, got involved in, more involved into the, my local chapter, started volunteering, got into some great, with some great guys uh, with the uh, Blood Brothers group and, um, you know, kind of opened my eyes for everything. So, um, I lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. Um, so, now I'm in a position to where, you know, after a lot of work and, and kind of some social searching with it, I um, am in a position to, um, I'm in a teaching hospital. I get to see residents uh, that are going to be doctors pretty soon. So um, they, I'm able to tell them because they're told, you know, in medical school, you're probably never going to see a bleeding disorders patient in your entire career. And I can kind of tell them, like, here I am, you know, this is, this is my story. This is kind of what's going on. And just because you don't normally see it doesn't mean that if you do see those symptoms that they should be written off right away. So a lot of them actually take that to heart as far as I know. And um, so, and I'm, you know, doing volunteer work with the infusion clinics at, at my local chapter and, uh, doing all that, my first um, impression of being, of being a man is you take care of your family, you are the provider, you're kind of supposed to be those, those things. And um, as far as like starting that, when I first uh, met my now wife, we just got married in April, um, I tried to tell her like, you don't really want to date me. Uh, you know, I've got all these things. This was around the time that I was, you know, just got released from the hospital from a teeth cleaning. So, and she stuck it out with me and, and is now part of the journey, part of my support, um, along with the, the bleeding disorders community. And, and it's, I've had a blessed life, you know, partially even because of the struggles that I went through. So, um, and that's kind of along with that theme of like the long journey. It took a long time to get here, but I'm grateful for everything that's happened and uh, that I've been able to to uh, continue and and now to be an advocate even uh, with the providers that are that are coming into the into the medical community. So I wanted to thank uh, John and everybody for having me. Um, I'm having a great experience here. I'm just going to answer some questions that I see here at the chat. Let's see. So Sarah KY says, curious how long when your Jason's sisters and mom's were, mom were diagnosed and when he was diagnosed. So my middle sister was diagnosed um, in junior high. She's a year younger than I am. So um, she was probably about 11 at the time. And I got diagnosed at... Um, I got diagnosed at 18 years old. So that, there was probably like an eight year gap. My mom got diagnosed a couple of years after me and my youngest sister got diagnosed the year after I did. Um, I don't see any more questions, so I'm gonna go ahead and pass it back to John. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jason. Uh, and thank you for sharing your story. And again, just to remind you all, if you have questions, you can please put them in the chat. And if we can't get them all to you today, we'll definitely email some of our amazing speakers and they can actually answer some of those questions and keep that dialogue going and keep that dialogue alive. Thank you, Jason, so much for sharing your story and for being the advocate that you are, uh, because we're all advocates at the end of the day. And we all have not just a story to share, but also to inspire other folks. And your story definitely is part of that journey that long journey that we started off with this session that you know earlier today. So thank you so very much. And congratulations um, on your marriage. So really excited for you. Last time I met you, or when I first met you, you were just engaged. It was also an honor to meet your wife. Uh, so to move further, you know, we are 
very privileged to have had a beautiful working relationship with WFH. And I've had the honor to work with this amazing woman, Luisa Durante, who is the head of programs and education with WFH. Had the opportunity to work with her, to collaborate with her, and also just to brainstorm. And what's amazing is that this community just keeps bringing amazing folks along my journey that help me want to do my work even better. So I'd like to introduce to you Luisa Durante, who's going to be talking about the great work that WFH is doing and the amazing work that she's doing. Luisa? Great. Thank you, John. First thing I want to say is thank you, Anna Jeff, uh, John particularly, as well as also, Lauren, thank you so much for inviting us. This is the third time that we participate in the VWD track at a Bleeding Disorder Conference of the NHF. And I can tell you that for me, it's incredibly inspiring. It's wonderful. I'm always really happy to share what we're doing globally. I think some of the themes of this pre-con are particularly interesting with sharing the journey we've all taken. There's also been a journey that's been going on globally I also want to thank all of you, Lisa, Jason, and Jill, for your stories and your testimonies. The type of hope and empowerment that you're sharing are things that we see worldwide. The stories, the things that you've gone through are things that I've heard from patients all around the world. And I really want to share with you some of the journey that the patients around the world are taking, what patient organizations are doing, and what are we doing at the WFH, at the World Federation of Hemophilia, to also really ensure that Treatment does improve for patients, for people living with VWD and care, and we're doing a lot of different things. So I'm really excited to be here and to share with you today what we are doing. So VWD, creating waves globally. So all of you have shared a little bit about what you're doing in NHF and how you're advocating for better care and how you're creating a lot of solidarity within the U.S. Well, how are we doing this internationally? How are we creating change through empowerment and through building of knowledge? Next, please. So I have no disclosures. Of course, I work with the WFH. I'm the head of programs and education. Our mission of who we are. So for all of us who might not know us, uh, our mission really is to improve and sustain care for people with inherited bleeding disorders around the world. And when I say this, I would like to say it's all bleeding disorders. And in, in the WFH, all bleeding disorders matter. It's really important for us. Our vision, of course, is treatment for all. So that one day, all people with a bleeding disorder will have proper care, no matter where they live, no matter what their social economic conditions are, everybody deserves care and treatment. We have some key strategic areas within the organization. One, of course, is to improve outreach and diagnosis. This is for all bleeding disorders and platelet disorders as well. Increase access to adequate and affordable care and increase sustainable access. And the word sustainable here is really important. Certainly we want to ensure that everybody has access to care and treatment and how do we ensure that it's long term. And this is where advocacy and empowerment really come into play and where it's incredibly important to keep building on that. Next please. I wanted to show you some data we have. So you know John showed you some data from the Better You Know campaign in the US. I wanted to show you what does uh, VWD look like in terms of diagnosis globally. Every year at the WFH, we produce our annual global survey. We collect data from several different countries all around the world, sometimes over 100 countries that share their data on all bleeding disorders. I particularly wanted to share with you what it looks like in terms of VWD, so that you have a sense of how many people globally now are actually diagnosed with VWD. We're about at 76,000 overall. Here, for example, the map that you see shows you the countries. It also gives you an idea of the numbers of people that are diagnosed with VWD per country. Next slide, please. This is also some data that we collected, and this shows you specifically more numbers. Where you see that arrow pointing down, that says the number of people identified with VWD overall. I wanted to show you, in keeping with the theme of it being a journey. If you look at the stats in 1999, we only had 24,000, almost 25,000 people diagnosed with VWD. In 2018, we're already almost at 79,000. So we are seeing change happen. There is more diagnosis, there is more education, and there is better clinical uh, management overall, which is incredibly important, I think, to recognize. So we are advancing. We still have a long way to go, we know, 
but this certainly is a huge leap forward in the bleeding disorder community. So this is wonderful news how far we've come. We still need to do a lot more, but we're getting there and we will continue to work on it. Next slide, please. So this is a mini report we did on gender. This is also to show you a little bit about the, the importance of being able to diagnose correctly and also being the importance of being able to dispel certain myths. So it has come across to me in some of my travels and talking with patients where sometimes people say, isn't it only women that have VWD? No, well, look at Jason. Jason's a wonderful example. He's a man with VWD. It's also come across in some of my discussions and conversations. Oh, isn't it only men who have VWD? Actually, look at Lisa and Jill and other people. So a part of our work is also really trying to dispel some of the myths that exist around vulnerable brand disease. And the mini report on gender helps do that. It helps shows numbers, specific numbers. In the AGS, the WFH, only in the last few years have started collecting data on gender distribution. So this is an important advance too for us in terms of being able to provide these type of statistics for advocacy purposes that can be used for advocacy. Next slide, please. So we have what we in the WFH, our VWD initiative program. This is a program that was designed about two years ago in 2018. This is a direct response uh, to the need of patients worldwide who came to the WFH and many patients have been saying to us, you know, how do we really do something specifically to bring VWD to the forefront? As we all know in the bleeding disorder community, hemophilia, of course, you know, has always been uh, the main focal point for many, many years. As the WFH expanded our vision, we started talking about all bleeding disorders. And all bleeding disorders, I will reiterate, really do matter. And this is really important to put to the forefront that all bleeding disorders need to be recognized equally. In doing that, and in responding to the needs of the community, we put together this program. So we assessed globally. One of the things I didn't mention from the beginning is that you know the WFH, maybe some of you know, and maybe some of you don't know, is that we work in, currently in 140 countries around the world. Our, our span is very large around the world, and we have 140 members, which is quite amazing. And one of the things we tend to do often is assess what are the needs overall. And we know there's a need to bring VWD more to the forefront. We know there's a need that it be recognized as it needs to be recognized. And this is a big part of that push, really, to empower the community forward in a lot of ways. This program really exists to improve diagnosis and clinical management of VWD, and really to empower the patient community and to build a patient community of advocates in a lot of ways that really can create more awareness about VWD. There's different components to this program. One is outreach where we support outreach in different countries around the world where they can go identify and diagnose. A big part of it too is creating awareness in patient communities, in our national member organizations, so that they integrate VWD into their actual mission, which is important. And some of them have done that. You're going to see later on some of the global actions, which have been wonderful. The points that you see here are our priority areas and bringing VWD to the forefront. And uh, some of the areas I mentioned, sharing knowledge, increasing diagnosis, improving care overall for healthcare providers as well as for patients and families, enhancing empowerment. I really enjoyed hearing some of the testimonies earlier from Lisa, Jason, and Jill where you talked about solidarity. The WFH, we're, we are a global community of patients with bleeding disorders around the world and we are a family. This is a global family and the global family serves of course all the local communities and our national members. And this is what we do, and we're really responding to that in a lot of ways. Next slide, please. So what is the global VWD call to action? Some of you will know this. In the WFH, uh, as a preface to this, we do have a VWD global group. It's made of 15 national member organizations. And a part of that is NHF. NHF is one of the members. And together we came up with this. It's called the global call to action. It's the first time in the WFH where we do something like this, where we are asking our national member organizations specifically to really sign on to this. It's an act of solidarity, and it's really to recognize and to break the stigma and isolation that exists with people living with VWD all around the world. If we look at the conditions of patients everywhere, it's very different in developing and developed countries. Having said that, in developed countries, even like the US, we know that there's a lot of challenges in diagnosis. Um, all of you have shared that today, that it can take years before you get a proper diagnosis. It is the same all around the world. That's not unusual. 
That's a reality that exists everywhere. So the call to action really is calling for adequate care and treatment and proper recognition, and that together as a global community of bleeding disorders, we really can improve care and access to treatment overall for patients. So this was designed in 2018. It was un unanimously adopted by the WFH. And let me show you where we are with this and the type of results we're having. Next slide, please. So these are the national member organizations that have signed on globally. At this stage, we have 47. Everywhere where you see different colors, that shows a country that signed on. It's pretty fun to see this map. I love seeing it. I know myself and my colleague, Alea, that works with me on this. We really enjoy seeing how this has grown over the years. And it's really grown over it as a result of education, patients being more empowered, talking to other patients, look, have you signed on to this? This is what we can do. We can take concrete actions in our countries to make change. And this is a great example of that happening. Next slide, please. So 47 NMOs, this is a list of all the countries around the world. There's quite a bit of diversity. Um, our goal is to have every single national member organization of the WFH sign on. Uh, if you recall, I said 140. So, you know, as I said, this is all about hope, and we certainly have a lot of hope that we are going to be able to do this. We have actually been able to create so many ripples in the ocean, and I talk about this a lot. I have a daughter, and we talk about this. How do you create change? Well, you create change really through being change yourself. I think, Jill, you talked a lot about that, about, you know, the sense of empowerment all of you have, and I think that's really what we do. We be an example. We are an example, and we share that globally with all of our members. So this is pretty exciting to see this, and we are very confident that it's going to grow as the year goes by, and this is a long-term campaign for us, so it will continue forward. Next slide, please. Actions around the world. So I love hearing about what's happening everywhere. In the times of COVID, you know, even before COVID, we saw lots of resilience, and we continue to see lots of resilience everywhere. And, you know, I have seen such amazing things that I think this is incredible. We really do need to share this with everyone and bring it out as far as possible. So I wanted to give you some examples of how people, how organizations are using the call to action. The, the first thing I want to say is that with the call to action, every national morning, every national member organization that signs on commits to doing some type of action. It could be any kind of action. It could be doing a conference. It could be writing an article in the newsletter. It could be using social media, for example, to educate. It could be talking to other organizations. But it has to be something concrete that really sticks to the principles of creating greater awareness, advocating, and empowering the BWD community. So one of the things that they did in Panama, if you see that great Yo soy um, von Willebrand, that means that I have von Willebrand disease. And it's a campaign that the Panamanian organization did in early 2019. In this organization, previous to this, they did not have VWD as a part of their mission. They actually included it in their overall mission, and they ran a campaign about this. And this is a wonderful achievement for them. That's one example. I wanted to show you what they did in the Netherlands. The Netherlands is involved, the organization involved in developing national guidelines on VWD. Again, that's really remarkable for a patient organization. They're advocating, they're at the table saying, this needs to be in their national guidelines. That's incredibly important. It shows the strength that they have to be able to negotiate and to be able to participate. The Canadian Hemophilia Society created a video on social media and a campaign on BWD. You see that photo there, no more missing a game period. So, you know, often we're, we're not comfortable talking about periods and all these kind of things. And this is a global phenomenon. It's not just in certain countries. And this is really breaking the stigma. We need to talk about blood. It's a reality. And when we're talking about girls and, and women that are affected by BWD, certainly we need to break that more and that isolation. So they did a whole campaign about that which is pretty interesting. There's also an organization in Bangladesh. They translated a resource that we have in WFH. Some of you might be familiar with it. It's a patient booklet that we produced on BWD that all patient organizations can use, and they translated it into their local language, which is important for their community. Next slide, please. So more examples. So let's go to Mexico. Mexico is really close to the U.S., of course. So in Mexico, too, they, they had conferences on VWD to raise awareness. Uh, Mexico, like NHF, the National Member Organization there, holds a, a conference 
quite frequently and they have, you know, many, many people that attend, providers and patients. So this was important to raise more of the issue of EWD there. The Nicaraguan Association also did something important. They advocate directly with their Ministry of Health. So they have gone directly to the ministry and said that, you know, they need to start purchasing a medicine for products for patients with VWD. They also did interviews. Uh, they also have, of course, a representative of someone of VWD on their board. Again, these are all examples of how patient organizations around the world are integrating VWD into the work they're doing. And this is a result of the overall campaign that we have been running to really get them to recognize it and to work on it more. Then we also have in Tunisia, they hosted a two-day workshop on care and treatment for VWD. Next slide, please. So what I wanted to show you and what's really important is that you're not alone. None of you are alone. This is one global community and the hope that exists is really large. And I always talk about oceans because I love water, but ocean, this is a community of oceans. I think anytime we make any type of change, it does have a ripple effect all over the world. And we are working united globally to improve care and treatment for people with VWD. I wanted to let you know that we are having an upcoming virtual session on the global call to action. Uh, we will be having organizations sharing their experience of what it's been like to sign on, the type of actions they've taken, and the type of change it's creating in their communities. I can say that, you know, having spoken to some of the patient organizations myself is that for the first time, they really feel quite empowered, which I think speaks volumes. So we invite you when the time comes to join in on that session. Next slide, please. So I like to always end off with a really positive note. And often my colleagues know I say this in the, often, in the office all the time. I say upwards and onwards. We just keep going up, 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 and up, and up, increasing diagnosis, increasing awareness, and increasing empowerment overall. So I'm going to leave you with this quote. You have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach the stars to change the world. And we all do. And we're all doing this right now. Next slide. So thank you all very much again for inviting the WFH to speak today. You can connect to us in all these different ways, and I'd be happy to take any questions, and feel free to contact me. Thank you. It's a real honor and a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Louisa, you are just incredible, and I truly appreciate you taking the time to be part of our conference here and to always just empower us um, on the work that WFH is doing and how you are leading this global um, call to action. And with that global call to action, NHF has also endorsed this and also has made it part of our mission. And our mission is also to empower our chapters and hopefully get more of our chapters to sign on to be part of this global call to action. As of now, we have 13 chapters that are part of NHF that have signed on to this global action because who else are better people to do the work than those people in the chapters to work out within their regions. And today we have two amazing folks that are doing great work um, in their chapters in the region. And I'd like to introduce to you one of, you know, I've got so many favorite folks that I work with, uh, but Bridget does a great, incredible work out in Missouri. And she's going to talk to you a little bit about the work that they've done and what are the work they're going to be doing with the Global Call to Action. Bridget? Good morning. Thank you, NHF. Good morning, top of the day. So um, thank you for having me. We um, started with this Better You Know campaign back last summer in 2019. What we did is we did a pre-conference to our annual meeting where we invited 15 females in and we did a train the trainer last summer so we could take them out and sit at conferences. We do a working women survival show. There's about eight to 10,000 participants that come through this conference and so we had women that could volunteer at our booth and go out and and share better you know information direct people to the website uh, learn how to test how to recognize signs for a bleeding disorder so in my uh, the screen up there you can see our booth the better you know heavy periods we had so many women and men stop by and say that looks like me those symptoms look like me but we started with the train the trainer program because we have um, passionate advocates out there that want to help and want to get awareness out there. And then um, something else we are doing, we are going to um, oncology students, we are going to nursing students, and we're speaking to them at the college, at the colleges, talking to them about uh, 
awareness and bringing just recognizing signs of a bleeding disorder we do that with our HTC staff so they're there and so we've brought a lot of awareness um, BWD was just always, we are Gateway Hemophilia Association and, and BWD was is about 50% of our population. And I, I just, for, for years, I felt like we didn't do enough for BWD and for just women in general with bleeding disorders. So about five years ago, we took this initiative and we have grown our organization at our annual meeting. We have about 50% BWD women. We have um, referrals, we, it's just, it's grown. So. I don't want to take up you know too much. Uh, we have a women's retreat. I know we're going to talk about next steps, but I think through the chapter level and when you work with your chapter and your HTC, you can truly go out there and you can train these advocates to get out there and talk to gynecologists, talk to nurses, talk to the general public, do social media posts like we've talked about today. Just awareness is huge and that's at ground level that we can all do. And the work, Bridget, that you are doing is not so much uh, with you, but I know you're also working with other chapters. And right before COVID hit, I know it's supposed to be you all out in Iowa uh, to do some more work uh, with VWD and the Better You Know uh, campaign. So I'm really excited that we actually move that forward at some point, whether that's virtually or eventually when we get to go and do uh, groundwork. So amazing work that you're doing out there and really appreciate you being part of this initiative. Uh, we also have Madonna also from uh, Oregon, who's gonna be talking about her organization and also sharing a little bit about her personal journey as well. Madonna? Good morning, everyone. Thanks, John. Thanks to NHF for having me. It's still morning here, so um, I'll say good morning. Um, I wanna talk a little bit real briefly about our women's conference. It's the Northwest Women's Conference. So John, do you wanna show that slide? Um, we've been doing it now for about eight years. Uh, we've been, brought in different OBGYNs and others to talk about women and the challenges they have. We um, have seen a large number of VWD people over the last few years. So when we signed on to the Call to Action Initiative by um, WFH, we decided to um, focus some of our future uh, women's conferences on some VWD topics that we haven't offered in the past. We've tried to keep it generic previously, but I think we're gonna do a lot more focus, um, mostly because that's a, a big issue of mine. My, um, my family was diagnosed with VWD uh, 16 years ago. So we had um, a situation where my son was uh, urinating blood and we, kind of, we had no idea what we were in for. In the end, it turned out that um, he actually had severe type 1 VWD, and so did his little sister, who was four months old at the time. And then my um, husband and older daughter were also eventually diagnosed. So for us, the story is personal. So uh, I've also been fortunate that as part of our chapter, we've been able to twin with Ethiopia as part of the hemophilia organization twinning program through WFH. So part of that call to action was to help sort of spread the word in Ethiopia as well. So my story is that when we got to Ethiopia, they told me, oh, we, we don't have anyone with VWD. We have no one diagnosed with that. My first year I was there, and um, that was in, in 2018. When I went back in 2019, they were so excited to tell me that they had now one newly diagnosed VWD patient. They were so proud of themselves, and they couldn't wait to tell me. And they were looking forward to um, finding many more in their country. So I feel like just my presence and my story helped them become much more aware. So I think um, besides just the better you know, just sharing your stories, just all of us with personal stories and sharing them. So John, if you want to show the next slide. So our family has kind of taken it on ourselves to um, spread that word even further. So each year my son, the one that's in um, the right-hand side, he actually started a walk team when we lived in Western Pennsylvania and called it the VWD Vanishing Veins because he could never get his veins when he treated at home. Um, we then shared that with all of our neighbors and all of our family and friends. And so we kind of have taken it on ourselves to spread the word about VWD as much as we possibly can because it's typically the girls, my daughter on the, on the left side there, she's um, now 16, but she was the one that was diagnosed at about four months old. Um, it's typically girls, and so when my son went to camp, they're always like, do you have hemophilia? And he always said, no, I have VWD. And they're like, well, why are you here? This is a hemophilia camp. 
So it took a while. It took a lot of years, a lot of sharing our story um, to get them to understand that VWD is serious. I've even had doctors tell me that it's the, the lesser of the two, so why do I even call in the on-call doctor? I've had long discussions with people um, in the on-call situation where I've actually trained the doctor um, on the phone. And so I hear all the stories that have been told before and um, take them all to heart and do my best in every part of my job and my family to try to spread that word that um, it isn't just in girls and in women, it's in men. And it isn't the lesser of the two. It is a serious disease, and we treat often. Um, and if you'll show the last picture, please. And so um, we took it even a step further. We um, adopted a little boy from China about two and a half years ago. So Gavin was added to our family. So my husband, Mike, um, has VWD. He was diagnosed at 44 after our three children were diagnosed. My daughter on the right is Maddie. She's 20. She has VWD. My son, Devin, 18, has VWD. My daughter, Erin, 16, has VWD. And then the youngest one, Gavin, um, he's 12, and he has severe hemophilia A. So, uh, so we, we really take bleeding disorders serious in our family, and we do our best to educate anyone and everyone we encounter through our walk team, through our neighborhood, through our schools, through everything possible. So that's our story. There you go, John. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Madonna. Thank you, everyone, for being part of this uh, amazing uh, opportunity to share stories and inspire folks. As I mentioned earlier, Jeanette Sessa wasn't able to be with us, but you know, we just wanted to mention about the VWD Foundation, Connect Foundation that she is running, and she's actually having her conference in November. So here's her information, so please make sure that if you're interested in, in learning a little bit more about the work that she's doing, um, here is the email. So what can you do? We're going to be asking you to not only do the evaluation, but do something with the information that you're learning. This session has over 77 people being part of it. And if everybody here did a little bit something or big something in regards to the change and the movement forward, the work that WFH is doing, the work that the Better You Know campaign is doing, and all these amazing chapters, as a community, we can move forward. I want to thank you so much for your time and for your energy and for my incredible speakers for taking time out of your Saturday to being here with us at our first virtual conference. Once again, my name is John Velasco. It is a pleasure being here with you all today. Please make sure you fill out your evaluation and it'll help us as we move forward with further conferences. Have a wonderful conference, everyone. Take care. Thank you.